Welcome to Something in the Wilderness. My name's Steve, and in each episode of the show, we select an Andrew McMahon song to discuss. Today I want to focus on what I'm going to call Andrew's least known single. It's a good song, and I think overall fans of Andrew do enjoy it, but it's not one that most fans clamor for or even talk about. It is surprising to me, though, because in my opinion, it's a great song. But it seems there were some barriers to this song ever getting to the mainstream. But I'd say the biggest barrier was the timing itself. Even so, we still have this song to enjoy and look back on, as a final footnote at the end of one of the several chapters in Andrew's music career. I remember first hearing this song as just another song on the album when it came out. And I don't say that to mean it wasn't a standout track, because actually it was one of the most memorable ones to this day for me. But I remember downloading this one on iTunes, promptly burning it to a CD, and I don't think that CD left my car for years. You know how a song or an album can take you back to a very specific time and place? Well, I remember specifically driving down the main road in the city I live in, listening to the CD in my car, and singing along to it. The band is Jack's Mannequin, and we're talking about Release Me, track two on People and Things, released on October 4th, 2011. The single was released just over a month later on November 8th, although it didn't make much of a splash at radio, and I don't think most people even knew it was a single. In fact, I was a big fan at the time, and I wasn't even aware it was a single. I just remember it, like I said, as part of an album of songs, and I didn't see it as a single. I didn't view it that way. There's sort of two music videos for this song, the official music video and the People and Things short film version, and I'll link both in the show notes. Now, you may remember, if you've listened to the show before, that There was a series of short films made, one for each of the songs on People and Things. And if you watch them, you'll notice that some of the visuals match up with the music and and some don't. But in the case of the Release Me short film, I do feel like the visuals were intentionally matched with the song. The plot is interesting, but it's a little unnerving too. It's not uncomfortable or offensive in any way, but it's art, you know, it makes you think. Anyway, let me break it down for you for a second. We start with a man walking down railroad tracks at night in the city but he's blindfolded and his hands are tied. Now I expected that someone was maybe following him or forcing him to walk from behind him, but there wasn't. But soon he comes to a road and then collapses into the, into the street. Like maybe he's exhausted from walking, but then a car pulls up and it's a woman. She wraps another rope around his hands and then leads him into the car. And then they drive through the city for a while and eventually head out to the desert. So now it's morning. They get out of the car She unties his hands, takes off his blindfold, and he just slowly and calmly looks at her. And it seems like it's going to be some romantic kiss or something, but then he just walks away from her out into the desert. So I'm guessing there's some symbolism here, like like maybe the man in the video felt trapped or held back by her, and she was finally letting him go. Or maybe they were in a relationship, and she's giving him the choice to stay or go. And she thought he would stay, but he chose to leave anyway. The, the official music video has an entirely different aesthetic, so if you don't like this short film, maybe you'll like the music video. It's really colorful and bright and loud and busy. And while the People and Things short film seems to focus on a relationship, the official music video appears to be about how demanding the music industry has been on Andrew. And maybe he doesn't feel like he fits in there. Throughout the video, he's walking through what appear to be studio sets in crowds of people, occasionally having brief interactions with them when he has to, trying to do his job at certain stops, but not really caring what's going on around him, or really it seems like he's just trying to avoid most of the noise. Another key characteristic of the video is the repetition. As he walks through these sets, it repeats. He has to walk through the same places by the same people and perform the same tasks over and over, even when he doesn't feel like it. And it's obvious that none of this feels real, or maybe it isn't real at all. In fact, the video ends with him pushing the fake set over and walking away from it. Maybe it symbolizes his desire to leave all the repetition and the pieces of the industry that he doesn't like behind. I don't know. I really like the music video, but it does irk me a little bit that there's no other members of the band in the video, as if he's the only member. And I know he wrote the songs, he sings and plays the piano, but on a rock song like this, I feel like the other instruments are just as important. Now it's possible the other band members weren't available for the shoot. It's also possible they didn't fit into the plot of the video, as in... It seems like Andrew's annoyed by everything and everyone in the video around him, and maybe they wouldn't want to portray him as being annoyed by his bandmates. And I can see how the whole plot would be really difficult to pull off with four band members, or even three that they had at the time, walking through the sets together. So I guess I see why it was only Andrew in the video, but it just seems like somehow they should have featured the band in it. 
So Release Me was the last song recorded for People and Things. When the album was ready to go, they said they needed one more song, which Andrew has stated that's pretty typical. Now, he was honored to be working with Rob Cavallo, a legendary producer, the same guy who produced most of Green Day's biggest albums, and albums by Goo Goo Dolls, Paramore, and My Chemical Romance. So when Rob came to him and said, hey, do you have one more? He did have several songs ready to go, he says, but he needed to find the right one for the spirit of this album. And since he was in the process of moving, he felt like he had this fresh perspective on the album, more like looking back at it like it was already finished. Overall, the album is about relationships and the people he was close to and how they're growing together, but in a different phase of their lives. But the other theme that emerged during this time for him was this idea of breaking free and releasing all the tension throughout the process of making this album, but also maybe tension in his interpersonal relationships. He was ready to be done with this chapter of his life, and he felt like this song embodied that spirit. It was recorded over a day and a half with Bobby Raw and Tim Pierce on guitars, Jay McMillan on drums, Jamie Muhubarak on keyboards, and Chris Chaney of Jane's Addiction on bass. The band recorded most everything live together, except for Andrew's piano, which was overdubbed after the fact. It was the first time in the making of the album that all these musicians were in the same room making music together, and Andrew said he was really proud of that. Most of the album, all the parts were recorded separately. But since they were in between bassists after John Sullivan left, and Mikey hadn't come on board yet, Chris Chaney played bass for the majority of the album. And prior to this, I had wondered about how Andrew and Chris Chaney would have crossed paths and knew each other. But I did learn recently that Chris played on the same Tommy Lee album that Andrew worked on years prior to this album we're talking about today. So I guess that's how they met. According to Setlist FM, this song's been played live 68 times by Jack's Mannequin. And as far as my research has shown, it hasn't been played live since the final Jack's Mannequin shows for Dear Jack in November of 2012. Now the great news is that that means the live version was immortalized in the form of the Live at the El Rey Theater release that came out shortly afterward. They played it third in the set. And you can stream that version of it on Spotify, or if you have the old CD, you can pull that out too. On one hand, 68 seems like a low number for an Andrews single to have been played live. But on the other hand, this song never hit it big with fans as far as I can tell. And it was the last Jack single before they broke up. But I'm a bit surprised that they haven't ever played this song at any of the 10-year or 15-year transit shows. So I'm putting in my request right now, hoping it'll be played live at the 20-year transit shows. But 68 times means it probably was actually played at just about every Jack's Mannequin show from the time they started promoting people and things right up until they broke up. In fact, the first time they ever played it was in June of 2011, a full four months before the album came out. My guess is they knew it was going to be a single. Now I'm still waiting for Andrew to play this one on a live stream, or heck, even out on tour. And for those of you who've been listening, you may remember I listed this song in my top five songs I wish he'd play in concert. And I'm still waiting. Andrew has called this one of the more literal songs he's ever written. He was so ready for this album to be done at this point, so he'd get out and promote it. So he wrote a song called Release Me, about the fact that the record company kept delaying it. So this was his kind of tongue-in-cheek response to the request for another song. He said this in an interview with MTV in 2011. It's very much about my experience doing what I do for a living, and how long I've been doing it. You get to these moments at the end of records where you want them to come out already. You want people to hear it. It's about the place I was in my life when I was wrapping the album up and feeling a little exhausted. So he was literally saying to the record company, release me, as in release this album, quit holding it up, believe in it. Andrew has stated time and again that much of his songwriting comes from where he's, he's at in his life currently. So when he wrote this song, he'd been married to Kelly for a while, but they didn't yet have a child, and he was coming to the end of Jack's Mannequin, though I'm not sure he knew that yet. We know this album was written heavily about relationships and that Andrew was looking forward to being done with the People and Things album. But looking at the bigger picture, I can't help but hear his overall frustration with the music industry coming in through these lyrics. At this point in time, he'd had what most would consider a full career with two different bands and no mainstream hit. I think he believed in this album, but it seems that someone at the record company maybe didn't have that same confidence. We'll talk more about those lyrics in a few, but like I said, I'd argue this song was about his overall career. And the official music video seems to drive that point home, too. So let's talk about the sound a little bit. To me, this song is really representative of a point I made last year on the Amy I episode. So back in the mid-90s, post-grunge, there was this boom of pop rock artists with multiple hits, or some that were just one-hit wonders. And I have trouble labeling this group of artists with a genre. 
Two of my favorite, most well-known acts to come from this era and this subgenre, if you will, are the Gin Blossoms and Better Than Ezra. It was a brand of music that borrowed a little bit from grunge and a bit more from pop, but had great rock and roll songwriting, very clean production, and every instrument kind of stood at its own for the most part. The vocals are very clear and singable. Whatever you'd call this genre is where I think Release Me fits best. And don't misunderstand me, this isn't an insult at all. This type of music made up a lot of what I was listening to at that time. You had some bands coming into the picture borrowing from grunge like the Cranberries and Counting Crows, and then there are the ones more on the pop rock side, such as the Wallflowers and Third Eye Blind, and I ate it all up. But it was surprising when Andrew McMahon of Something Corporate, even coming off of his first two albums with Jack's Mannequin, leaned kind of more into this sound that had been dominating the airwaves more than a decade earlier. And hey, speaking of Counting Crows, I was listening to their 1999 This Desert Life album, getting inspired for this episode, and I noticed a song called Amy Hit the Atmosphere. Now, being that Andrew has cited Counting Crows as one of his favorite 90s artists while growing up, and he graduated high school really close to that time, and he wrote a song called Amy I for the album we're talking about today, and we don't know where that name came from, I think it's pretty possible that the inspiration for the name may have come from Counting Crows. Just saying. So I'll just go ahead and say it. If you like people and things, you should probably be listening to at least the first three Counting Crows albums. There are more parallels than what I just mentioned. But truth be told, I don't know what Release Me would sound like if Jim Wirt had produced it, like he did with all of Andrew's previous stuff. Maybe the edges would be rougher, maybe the vocals would be a little bit more loose, maybe the guitars would be more distorted, or heavier, or both. Either way, but I do think it more likely would have been a hit if it had come out in the second half of the 90s, when these other bands I mentioned were popular, on what we called alternative radio back then. And it's no surprise that Andrew recorded an album that sounded like it was from the mid-90s. That's who he was influenced by. He was in high school at the time. Where I grew up in Detroit, the popular station for this type of music back then was called the River 93.9. If you had that clean production and those pop elements, but definitely somewhere in the rock genre, then you were welcome on the river. You can't deny the catchy chorus of Release Me, and that's certainly the most recognizable piece of this song for fans. But the guitar is really strong throughout, right from the opening chords. It really drives the song, and in fact, makes it clear that this is a rock song. But you may or may not notice that the song never goes beyond that mid-range, even in the chorus. And it almost feels like at times, like it's supposed to open up a bit more and let loose. But it keeps pretty even keeled across the entire 316 runtime. And not to beat a dead horse, but the subgenre that I mentioned earlier that the song fits into most for me becomes clear during the bridge. There are some production choices that really come to the forefront for me. And speaking of coming to the forefront, how about that bass during the bridge? The guitar and the piano drop off, So the bass gets really showcased here. And I really like that part because it lets the bass build you back up to the chorus. Overall, I'd call this a great piano rock song. And that label really is my problem when it comes to most of the other artists I mentioned. None of those other artists had a piano that was central to their sound for the most part. So I guess that just leaves bands like The Wallflowers and Counting Crows and Gin Blossoms and Better Than Ezra and The Cranberries as just rock or alternative rock. But the label alternative really was overused back then. Oh well, let's move on to lyrics. The first thing I want to say is I love the lyrics to this song. I think they're really powerful, especially when you think about Andrew's career trajectory while you're reading them. The first verse covers most of the history of his career and may even have a reference to his battle with cancer. I've been running such a long time. I've been hiding from the truth. I've been battered, been broken, been buried. Now I'm death proof. Andrew's been working hard for over a decade in the industry at this point. He's done what's asked of him, He's written some great songs. He's played nice with people when he's supposed to. And in the process, he's felt run over and hurt by some of these people and things. But despite all the experiences, he's learned lessons that have made him stronger. And like I said, that last part may also refer to him being sick. Either way, I think what he's saying here is he's already seen the worst of it and overcome it. In the rest of the verse, he sings, And I've been known to take a big chance, but I can't waste another shot at redemption. I'm ready, don't let me go passing through the wrong hands. My confidence is in crisis mode. Your fingertips, will they know the code? I would say that Andrew took the biggest risk of all in his career when he left a successful rock band in something corporate to strike out on his own as Jack's mannequin. Now, I'm not sure what the redemption here in the lyrics is referring to, but I guess he felt like he needed to redeem himself, and he was taking another shot at it by releasing this album, which was a little bit different than what he'd done before. But the wrong hands line to me is a little bit more obvious. You hear a lot of musicians tell stories of bad record deals where certain things were promised to the artist, but the follow-through ended up differently. 
I know Andrew has had at least one experience like this, but probably more than one. For an artist to end up in the wrong hands, professionally, can be a career killer. The most talented musician in the world can end up in a bad record deal and lose some of their most prolific work. As anxious as Andrew was, was feeling during this period about getting his music out, I think he was worried that it either wouldn't get released or maybe it wouldn't get the promotion it deserved, which arguably may have happened here. At that point, he had no control over when the music came out or what would be done with it when it was. Once he writes the songs, records them to the best of his ability, it's now in the hands of others. And I love that line, my confidence is in crisis mode. Your fingertips, well, they know the code. I used to think of that as a reference to his relationship with Kelly, like only she knows how, how to help him. And that could be it too, but I truly think this was a reference to the control over his art being in someone else's hands. Next up, the chorus. Release me and take another piece of me and there won't be another left. Come on, release me. Take another piece of me and there won't be another left unless you let go. Very literal, like Andrew stated. He just wants his music to get out there. Though, I have a bigger picture theory on what the chorus means. I wonder if he felt like the record company had a stranglehold on his music and his career at the time. I've never heard him specifically state this about the end of Jack's Mannequin, but sometimes a band will sign a multi-record deal and then they're committed. And sometimes within that contract, there's a stipulation that if they break up, they don't have to fulfill it anymore, or they can buy themselves out of it. I do wonder if he didn't feel taken care of in his current deal. And maybe this chorus was his message to the record company about his career. Because a year later, the band broke up and they moved on to something else. Just a theory. The second verse starts off with the most cryptic lyrics of the song, in my opinion. I've been waiting for the sun to shine. Another winter ends, the winter starting over. We met beside a landmine waiting for the wind to blow. Again, cryptic, and I'm not sure exactly what he's referring to, but I love those lines. And I can only assume it means like the seasons are passing or the years are going by and he's kind of feeling stuck and he needs to move on. Now I'm in trouble with these friends of mine. A change was in my blood. I lost my sense of direction. I drag us to the bright light. Life is like a TV show. My fuse is set. I'm pressing go. Your match is lit, but it's burning slow. His friends are there with him. He doesn't know if they're heading in the right direction. He feels like they're in the spotlight, but maybe they're not supposed to be. And then the bridge. I'll be nothing but sand falling down through your fingers to the ground below. And I think that's a reference to maybe how unimportant he feels to the record label or how unimportant he feels his album is to them. Like they're just letting it slip by when they could have released it a little sooner. And then he repeats the lines from the beginning of the song. And I like this trick, bringing the song back around to full circle. Yeah, I've been running, I've been running, I've been running such a long time. And then it builds us back to the chorus. I think this song's strongest moments are in the chorus, which I know can be a pretty typical answer. But if I have to branch out a little bit, I also want to give credit to the bass and the guitar work in this song. Though the piano balances them out nicely on the track, the bass and guitar do all the heavy lifting, and it really brings a song to life. I do notice my ears following the guitar for most of the song. Besides the live version on the Live of the El Rey collection that I mentioned earlier, I did find a piano-only version recording that I'll link in the show notes as well. And you may notice when it's just Andrew singing this song over a piano, the song kind of turns into a somber ballad. I feel like there's a lot more anger and frustration coming through on the full band track, which makes it feel more like a rock song. But when you get to the core of it, it actually sounds pretty sad. And as a big fan of sad songs, I love this version. Now, I don't love it more than the original, but I love that it gives you a different flavor of the song while the sentiment remains the same. And I also want to point out a great cover of this song out there, done by a former guest of ours, Anne of Analyza. I don't think this song gets enough love in general, so I was really surprised and excited when I saw that Anne performed this on her YouTube channel two years ago. So I'll link her rendition in the show notes as well. I would encourage any Jack's Mannequin fan or fan of that mid to late 90s alternative rock to go back and give this one a few more spins. I don't think this song had the credit it deserved when it came out, and I still think it's overlooked among the fan base. Though it's a great rock song with fantastic lyrics that really are a snapshot in time from where Andrew was in that moment. Thank you again for listening. If you wouldn't mind rating this show on Apple Podcasts and Spotify or wherever else you can, I'd appreciate it. Also, post a comment on one of our socials or DM me on Instagram. I'd love to hear your thoughts on the episode. And you can always email somethinginthewilderness at gmail.com if you want. We have a couple of great guest episodes in the coming months. But in the meantime, 
If you haven't yet listened to all the previous episodes, this is a good time to go get caught up. It's March in the Midwest now. I've been waiting for the sun to shine. Another winter ends, the winter's starting over. 